Happy Mother's Day. What a great day it is to be here, um, to celebrate together, um, being in God's house on this beautiful day. Um, our friends in the East Coast are having a little bit of a harder time. We already experienced that a few days ago. Um, but as we celebrate together today um, on this gorgeous day outside, we remember how blessed we are to be here. There's all kinds of days on the church calendar. There's liturgical days, right, that have been in the history of the church for thousands of years, and we put those down as Easter and Christmas Eve and um, all kinds of days, Transfiguration Sunday. There's all kinds of things that we celebrate together. And then there's what we affectionately call in the church as Hallmark Days, and today is a great Hallmark Day, isn't it? Um, a day that, like Mother's Day as we, and Father's Day as we celebrate um, together. And, and in the church tradition days, we celebrate how the church and its tradition makes an impact on our life. Um, on Hallmark Days, it's a day for us to celebrate how people make an impact on our lives. And there is someone in all of our minds this morning, um, and there's more than likely a list of people in our minds this morning. Some of them are with us. Some of them have gone to see Jesus. And yet all of those people are here as we celebrate with us in the presence of God and this great community of saints that gathers together. And we celebrate who it is that God puts in our life. Because without those people, without your mother, you'd have a hard time today, wouldn't you? They played a fairly important role in your life at one moment. And we celebrate that today. So let's go to God in a word of prayer as we give him thanks for all of these things that we have this morning. Gracious God, we're thankful for the people that you put into our life. God, we're thankful for a chance to take a breath this morning and to remember, God, that we were never, ever supposed to do this by ourselves. For the very first day of our life, for the very first breath that we took, God, Lord, you put someone there to be with us. And I pray, God, this morning that we might remember that in this moment where we struggle, struggle, God, to live in this world as you would have us live. God, that we would remember this promise that we remember on days like this, that you put people in our lives for a reason. And God, we are thankful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was wandering the halls of Target on Thursday making my way to a very special section, a section that pretty much stays clear for most of, the, most of the time, except for on these great days, these weeks before Mother's Day and Father's Day and, and all of the things that we celebrate. And there were two aisles jam-packed with carts and people. You know what those aisles were. They were the Hallmark aisles. You've seen them? And, and you've probably even been there in the last few days. They should have a sign outside of it that says, no carts allowed, because people were climbing in and around and over other people's shopping carts, trying to find a card that would say the right thing. And sure enough, as I was standing there next to the Hallmark Isles, I heard a one lady shout out in, in just exasperation, I never can find the right words that define what I want to say to my mother. And about five people down, someone answered her exasperation. And she, she yelled back over the heads of five people. She said, that's why I always bring a Sharpie with me to the Hallmark aisle. And sure enough, she had her Sharpie pin out. And she had a card in her hand, crossing things out on the card that she had yet to buy, trying to make it say what she wanted to say. Now, the problem was, is I didn't have enough time, and I got crowded out of that aisle and went to another. I was just waiting for that lady to get frustrated and put that card back, and someone inherit her Sharpie remarks on the card. Guy, it's an impossibility, isn't it? Because we go and we pay six ninety five at minimum to buy a card, right, that used to cost 50 cents. Can I just point that out? The dollar store, you can still get it for a dollar. But sure enough, we, we gather together and, and, and we, we pay $7 for someone else to write words about what we want to say to someone that we love. And, and, and you know, I, I completely understand why all those people are gathered there. Because it's pretty hard to put into words about how I feel about my mom. It's better for someone else to write. It's easier for someone else to write it. And so we're willing to put a pretty picture and four written words there on a card that we put a stamp on and send it to someone we love. 
What's interesting about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, arguably the most famous verse in the uh, chapter in the Bible. Now, you could say that John 3.16 is the most famous verse. I, I would say that Corinthians is probably the most famous chapter. Um, in fact, I bet even some of you can recite it by memory, not necessarily because you're great biblical scholars, but because you've been to more than 10 weddings in your life, amen? And, and you've heard this because I would say of the hundreds of weddings that I've done, over 60% easy, this is the chapter that's chosen. And, and, and so we gather together and we read these words. Why is this verse so famous? It's because, in some ways, it's the hallmark verse of the Bible. Paul takes it upon himself, just in the middle of his tirade against this church that's falling apart and being divisive, Paul decides to just stop and give us a definition write down on a card what he thinks the definition of love is. At, to the point where it almost doesn't even fit in the letter. It's a little abrupt even when we get there, but he does it anyway. He stops and he decides he's going to write his own Hallmark card. And he's going to tell this church that's, that's struggling in life this definition of what the word love means. Now, you're going to notice that this is not a Merriam-Webster definition. A Merriam-Webster definition is about this long, and you can fit into a big book with a thousand, a million other words in that book. No, this takes a whole chapter of the Bible, and Paul begins to write. Now, what's amazing about this is, is Paul doesn't do this on his own. He doesn't just pull these words out of the air. Paul takes every famous person that he's ever met before. Tertius, an ancient philosopher, Plato, Ezra, a great scholar of the Bible. He takes the greatest minds that he knows, and he combines their thoughts and their process and their theory and puts it all together so that he might form not his definition, but all of the definitions that he's seen over time. Let's put them all together and give the best answer that we can. What's your definition this morning of the word love? I, I can tell you for sure that it was my mother's, both of them, that first taught me what love is. Not just about what they said with their mouths, but how they held me, how they embraced me, how they welcomed me into the world. My guess is, is that you have someone like that in your life. Someone like Paul did. Someone who was big enough and bold enough and important enough that he respected what they said and what they did. And so he takes pieces, pictures of people and their words, and he starts to piece them together. Love is not envious. It's patient. It's kind. It doesn't boast. Love is, well, it endures all things. It bears all things. It believes all things, Paul says. Love never fails. It never fails. A few years ago, there's a woman in my life who taught me a lot about love. In fact, it was um, really the first year that McKenna was born. Kristen was working, and we had to find a place to take this bundle of joy, this incredible gift that we had, and, and, and give it to someone for six or seven hours a day to let them watch her and help her grow because we were both employed. It was a hard, hard, painful decision for us to search, and yet we really came to it pretty quickly because there was one woman in our life that we really trusted that way. All of our parents were in all different parts of Texas, and they couldn't do it. So we went over to her house, and I remember I was tasked that first day of, of taking her over to her house because Kristen had to be at work a whole lot earlier than I, does, or I did, and I took this 15-pound baby over to um, this lady's house who, um, well... She taught me a lot about life. 
And I, I remember handing her the baby, all 15 pounds of it, and I said, I'll be right back. And I went to the car and brought the other 150 pounds of paraphernalia that a 15-pound baby requires. Now, they don't eat 150 pounds, so I don't know where all that other 150 pounds comes from, but sure enough, um, I brought it all in, two trips to the car and back to accompany this tiny child. And, and I remember being a little late and a little sweaty. It was kind of hot outside, and I, I was like, gosh, you know, i got to get in the car. I've got 15 minutes till I, I get to my next meeting. And, and I said, well, thank you so much. I gave her a hug. I gave the baby a kiss. And she said, well, where are you going? And I said, well, I've got a meeting in 15 minutes. i got to get to the church. She said, no, you don't. You came through my door. I've got to feed you breakfast this morning. I said, but I don't have time. I've got a meeting at the church. And she said, who's the meeting with? And I told her, she said, I'll call them and tell them you'll be there in an hour and a half. Well, how long does it take to eat breakfast? Well, sure enough, she got on the phone and she called him and said, I'll be, Preston will be there in an hour and a half. He'll be late. Just wait on him. You can meet with him then. Go and sit down at the table, son, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go cook breakfast. So sure enough, I sit down at the table and she brings me the paper. And she puts the paper down in front of me. And then she goes and asks me what I want. And do I like gravy with my biscuits? I said, no, ma'am, I don't eat gravy from, with my biscuits. She said, you must not be from the South. <laughs> and I sat down at the table. And the next thing you know, her husband comes out in his bathrobe and comes and sits down at the table with me. And she starts to cook breakfast. And, and she sits down. And about 20 minutes later, and we start to eat. And she said, tell me about your day. And for the next hour, we talked. Turns out, that wasn't a one-time thing. She expected to do that every time I dropped off the baby. Twice a week. And twice a week, I'd have to schedule, I got to schedule an hour and a half of my day into sitting down at this incredible saint of a woman's table. And, and there were days that were good days, and we talked about good things. There were days that were bad days, and we talked about bad things. There were days that we were irritated at each other, yet they didn't matter. An hour and a half for breakfast every time I came. There's some words that ring in my head. You came through my door, she said. I need to feed you breakfast. There's something in, in our lives, something that I, I hold on to mothers for in my life. That, that, that there's a courage in, in the woman that, that was used to bring me into this world by the creation of God. And, and sure enough, there's this courage that, that she said, you know, something's coming through my door today. All of us had one of these mothers. Something new came in my door and, well, I, I'm willing. I'm willing to find out what it's going to be like not only serve this child breakfast, but to help him grow. It, it turns out that on the Hallmark aisle, well, the cards aren't exactly right. There's a little editing that, that Paul wants us to do. There's a, an adventure that God wants us to go on. The question this morning is, are our doors open for people to come in? The people that God brings in our life, will we have the courage like our mothers did to bring those people in and say, I'm willing to write something new down about what love means. I'm willing to find a new way in my life, a new person in my life that will add a, another paragraph to the definition. Paul invites us in 1 Corinthians 13, he, he invites us to open up our lives and say, what will love bring to it next? This is the love that it's there. It, it never ends. It never fails. It bears and believes and endures all things. Turns out we get to define it every day, maybe even in a different way. I had a friend in high school that um, as we started to get together into small groups of high school, um, we started to talk about our lives. And, and I remember we, we were getting together um, one Friday night, and I said, hey, you want to go hang out? And he said, no, I, I already have enough friends. Well, that's kind of weird. He said, yeah, I've got three friends. I'm all full up. I said, you don't have room for another friend? He said, nope, three's enough. And turns out, 
we didn't talk much after that because that was kind of weird, you know, a little awkward. But high school is the king of being awkward back in the day. And sure enough, for a couple of years, he lived with just these three friends. That's all he did with anybody were these three friends until one of the friends moved away and the other two started dating and things got weird for him. And the next thing you know, junior year, he asked if he could come hang out with me. You know what my temptation was to say to him? No, I'm all full up, thanks. I got enough friends. But it turns out my mom taught me that, that life is supposed to be a little bit more open. You're supposed to be a little bit more loving than that. Jesus says something about that, right? Paul does too. Love is patient, it's kind, it's not envious, it doesn't boast. So we begin to hang out. You know, there's, there's a time in our life where we have to decide, is the door open or is it shut? Are we willing to cook breakfast for people or is that door closed? For, for most of us, we have, all of us, have that moment in life where our definition of love has stopped. Our definition of love is, it's, well, it's been defined. And we shut that door and we say, I'm all full up, God. I've got enough people to take care of. Amen? I've had enough challenge, enough risk in my life. I, I've got the people that I know. And yeah, that's not what any of my mothers have ever taught me. In fact, they've always kicked the door open. It turns out there's a story that Jerome, an early bishop in the, the ancient church, used to tell about a medieval cobbler, a shoemaker. And, and sure enough, this shoemaker would, would sit in his shop and he'd make shoes all day, and, and he'd leave the door of the shop open. Now remember, this is not the world of central heating and central cooling. This is a man that, that he had a fireplace that would warm three feet unless he took that door and shut it and tried to keep the heat in the house when it was frigid outside. This is a man in the, in the, the, the degrees of heat in the world, um, and, and when the wind's blowing and blowing dust in his door and the snow snows and puts snow in, or if it rains, torrential rainfall, and, and the water starts to come in, it didn't matter. This medieval cobbler kept his door open, and someone asked, him one day why he was so weird. Why, why would you leave your door open to the elements all day long? What's the point in having a door? The cobbler said, I leave the door open so that if Jesus comes, he can come inside and sit at my table. There's a moment in life where you and I decide in the name of love, if the door is open or if the door is shut. My friend a few years ago who cooked me breakfast taught me about the joy of leaving the door open. Taught me the joy about what it means to bring people into your life, what it means for God to send people through our doors and open up the paper and talk about good days when they're good and bad days when they're bad, and all the days in between. Just like my mothers did when I was growing up. They, they loved me when days were good, and they loved me when days were bad, and all the days that we were even tense with each other, they loved me then too, because they were willing. They're willing to keep the door open. It takes courage, doesn't it? To let just anyone that God chooses to walk through that door and yet, for us in this room, we're here today because someone in our life had the courage to leave the door open, to welcome us into their family, to get out their Sharpie pen, open up the card of what they thought love was, and start writing new words because of you, because of me. And the courage that we have to ask ourselves today is, do we have the courage to put a Sharpie pen in our pocket when we go to Target? To put a Sharpie pen in our pocket as we, we live this world, to keep the door wide open and say, my definition of what love looks like, it's not finished. It's not done. There's more people that God is willing to send through that door. Well, I'll leave it open. For God to send them through. Will I leave it open 
for God himself maybe one day to walk through the door and sit at my table. Let's pray. Gracious God, this morning, our, our list sitting here in church, it, it grows longer every year. The number of mothers, God, that we have to call when we get home, Lord, we pray is more than it used to be. Because we've let more people into our lives and they've let us into theirs. I pray this morning, God, that we would have the courage like those mothers before me have had and we kick that door wide open. God, that we're ready to put new faces, new philosophies, new definitions, God, on what this force, this experience of love really is. And how, God, it can always be so much more if we're willing for you to send people through the door, if we're willing, God, for you yourself to come through and show us a more excellent way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.